Starliner Media. Starliner Media presents Music Night at the Majestic with your host, Michael Boswell. All right, it's time once again for Music Night at the Majestic. And with us tonight, John D. Nicola, Frankie Brevett, and Stacey Weidlitz, uh, songwriters who gave us songs from Dirty Dancing, which is celebrating its 35th anniversary this year. Guys, welcome to the show. Thanks for having Thanks, us. Michael. Today, uh, for, for uh, th there's such a great story with Dirty Dancing for a project that started so small and nobody had expectations for within the business. And then it just takes off, gets a life of its own. And here we are 35 years later, still talking about it. Pretty crazy. Yeah, it's, it, yeah. it was definitely um, completely unexpected because, uh, you know, I knew about the project leading up to it because I was friends with Patrick and, and uh, who I knew as Buddy. Uh, that's how family and friends knew him. And we had written... Our song, She's Like the Wind, two years prior to the movie. So I was tracking the film uh, also through my agent, the agents that represented me and all this. And, and the word on the street was, this is terrible. It's going straight to video after one week. And that'll be the end of it. And so I thought to myself, okay, you know, I got a couple of thousand dollars for the license fee. And, and that's the end of it. And then it just exploded. Did you happen yeah. to hear um, anybody happen to hear Jennifer Gray talking about uh, how it was, uh, you know, a, a tiny budget? She, she just because she's got a book coming out, and she talks about how it was such a tiny budget, and they had they couldn't do it in the summer because there were still guests there, so they had to wait till the winter, and they're painting leaves green, and they said it was just. She said it was. It's amazing that it saw the light of day and that it took off the, the way it did, you know? Yeah. yeah there, you there, guys there, before... Go ahead, Frankie. Like, there's so many different uh, aspects that happened to this movie that, you know, the stars had to align and they did, yeah. you know, to have this phenomenon happen and for us to be talking about it 35 years later. That, that's what and, I mean. And, you know, I it was this, you yeah. know, some of all the parts you know, probably pulling out, you know, one or two of those parts of Patrick or the song or, you know, Jennifer or something else probably wouldn't have had the same phenomenon happen. But the, all those parts together and probably a lot of us, you know, not having success for so long were, were due, you know. So, you know, uh, the, the songs that John and I wrote, which were Time of My Life and Hungry Eyes and Stacy wrote, She's Like the Wind with with Buddy, with Patrick, you know, kind of took a life of their own and, you know, took me from being uh, a performer, Frankie and the Knockouts, having hit records back with Millennium Records, to now all of a sudden, I'm a songwriter. I'm no longer a performer. I became a songwriter that day. And people didn't look at me as, oh, Frankie Prebber from Frankie and the Knockouts. I was the guy who wrote the song, you know, co-wrote the song. And so that whole career of the the 35 year career of me trying to be a rock and roll star kind of went south, you know. And, and there I am, a writer. Finally, I became a songwriter. And, yeah, and you, know, you know what? I I feel like the artist is more respected than the songwriter, honestly. Well, they say here's Bill Medley and Jennifer Warren's time of my life. He, here's Eric Carmen's Hungry Eyes. Right. Just in general, I think artists. Songwriters, as we see with our Spotify statements, songwriters are the bottom of the food chain. All yeah. the, like in, in a, sorry to say, yes. Yeah. So yeah, I, you, you never hear of a young starlet sleeping with the composer or songwriter to get ahead in the business. <laughs> <laughs> the Madonna. Oh, but if. Yeah. yeah, you don't have the same leverage as an artist. There's a little bit of leverage, you know what I mean? Yeah. As a songwriter, you know, I get the next song, you know. I, I guess when you get to Diane Warren's status, maybe, I don't know. But uh, I've always kind of, I've, you know, an artist is is uh, a commodity. A songwriter, yeah, it is, is but uh, they, they get kind of, uh, don't get respected, really. I feel like Rodney Dangerfield. 
Well, yeah, it, I, I see it's kind of interesting they have this new uh, show on TV about songwriters. Right. Do you know about you? Obviously, you know about that, Stace. Yeah, yeah. I you haven't know. seen it, though. I haven't watched it. I haven't you know, watched it, but it's interesting. Now it's a twist on, oh, the songs and the songwriters and the people from, you know, Nashville, the songwriter from Jersey, you know, that kind of a thing. Right. So uh, maybe maybe uh, it's time for the songwriter to get their due. Yeah. You know, well, uh, we yeah. lucked out because at that particular moment in time, 1987, CDs meant something. LPs actually started on LPs and then right and and we slid under that limbo bar of yeah. that it meant something to to get a CD or an album and it's selling you know 40 50,000 million excuse me records and you know us being able to be there at that time now a young songwriter is like left in limbo with waiting for Spotify to send them a 100 dollar check after they had a million spins Exactly. So well, you know, old, looking, you know, you know, looking at the, 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 the sales uh, of the soundtrack, Frankie, uh, it was like in October of 87, the soundtrack had sold a half million copies going gold. And then within like 14 months, it was it had sold 10 million copies, right? 10 times platinum in America alone. Right. Yes. Yeah, so, and nowadays, you're not going to get a 10 times platinum album. No, it'd be hard to do. It would be yeah, hard to do. The plaque behind me is for the soundtrack, and that's representing 11 million sold in the U.S. alone. Uh, and it, it was interesting because I tell the story where um, after the soundtrack was released, but before She's Like the Wind was released as a single, Michael Lloyd, who produced both She's Like the Wind and Time of My Life, uh, called me and said, hey, you're getting a gold record. And I said, oh, great. I, you know, I've never gotten a gold record. And I, I really wasn't in the record music business. I was in the TV and film music business. So I was very excited. And then like a week and a half later, I called Michael and I said, you know, what's the process? When do I get the record? How does it arrive? Uh, you know, the gold record. And he said, oh, you're not getting a gold record. And I said, why? You told me that I am. And he said, well, now you're getting a platinum record. And so I said, you're kidding. And he said, no, last Sunday it sold 280,000 copies. It's crazy. And when it finally did arrive, when Buddy and I got our first platinum records, it was triple platinum at that point. And Wendy Fraser, who sang on the song, who used to was my girlfriend up until three, three weeks before the single was released, which is great. Oh. Uh, uh, when she got hers just a couple of weeks later, that was uh, quadruple platinum. Wow. So it, it was amazing. Sounded like hotcakes. Well, you know what? I, I you know, experienced that um, in talking with Jimmy Einer and, and talking with uh, some of the executives that the uh, film company and the record label weren't on the same page. And so the film company being RCA at that time, uh, released Time of My Life AC, Adult Contemporary. And it started to go up the charts, but uh, Vestron Films decided that they were gonna hold the movie back for a month. And so RCA was like, where's your little movie? Oh, we decided to you know, postpone things. And so RCA got really frustrated and just said, take the movie and we're out. So there, it was only supposed to come out for, I think, uh, a week or two, and then to go to VHS, was it, at that time? Yeah, it was supposed to go to VHS. <laughs> and yeah. uh, so they had no feeling for the movie that it was going to do any, anything, and neither did RCA. And so when the movie came out, within the first, I think, week or two of the movie being out, there were 300,000 records back ordered. And RCA was scrambling to, you know, press some records. And by the time they were able to get some records out, there was already a million records back ordered. So I, when I look at the success uh, of this phenomenon that happened to us, it was really Joe Public that created this. It, it wasn't, 
big brother coming in and, and, you know, splashing a lot of money and, and making a film happen. It was really the public that embraced what was happening with Patrick on that scene and Jennifer and the little dirty dancing story. And then the culmination of the music. Yeah. And they were smart enough to use like a person from the sixties, like Bill Medley to be the thread to take that 87 pop song back to 1963 and give it some rele relevance to the era. And so there was a lot of smart decisions being made there. And, um, and I think that, you know, Bill and Jennifer singing on it was another one of those connecting moments, those take those two out of there and you don't have the same sound. Even though they filmed the movie to John and my and Donnie's demo with me singing Time of My Life and, and uh, Rochelle Capelli singing Time of My Life. They filmed that scene and Hungry Eyes to our demos. So the crew and, and all the directors and producers got demoitis, I call it. They got so used to hearing my voice and they were like, oh, where's Frankie? You know, well, you know, we want Frankie's voice. And, you know, so I was just ecstatic. To have Bill Medley, I mean, one of my like oh. iconic heroes from being a kid, to sing on on one of my songs, so it didn't bother me at all. Uh, I was asked to sing "Hungry Eyes," and then I got bounced like two days before uh, by Eric Carmen because the RCA got a new president, and the new president brought in Eric, and so when John and I were in New York looking to write for another scene, Emil Ardolino called us in. And he goes, what's the BPMs for uh, for Hungry Eyes? And I go, why? We're, we're recording it Monday. And he goes, no, they're having a hard time locking up the BPMs with, with the recording. I said, we're recording it Monday. And he goes, oh, you didn't hear Eric Carmen is recording. Oh, boy. So we kind of found out, you know, through the grapevine that we were out. Oh, but, by the know, way. Like, as long as they remember our, our address, I'm good. Yeah, right. <laughs> Exactly. Well, tell you what, before we get uh, too far into the, the soundtrack itself, Frankie, you alluded to the uh, fact that you guys had uh, done tons of work prior to getting to, to the to the soundtrack. Now, John, uh, you actually had came from kind of a, of a prog rock background, correct? Uh, I guess you could call. I mean, that was just one thing I did. I, I see it on the wall. Behind, is that yeah. on the wall back there? Yeah, that was on. It was a band called Flight on Motown Records, and um, I guess that was around 1981 or 82, or I can't remember what year exactly. But it was a jazz fusion. We were signed to Motown Records. It was um, Lee Young, so Lester Young's brother was the A and R guy, and uh, and. Uh, you know, it, it didn't really get off the ground, but it, it, it was enough that um, Erica Badu found it in the Motown, uh, uh, you know, bin there. And um, she sampled it for her hit um, back, uh, what's the name of that? Back in the day, back in the day, I think. It was a big hit. So she, you know, she directly sampled a song uh, off of that record, uh, Face to Face was the song. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was playing some fusion stuff, but I, I think uh, by the time Frankie and I met, I was kind of working in uh, like a, a rock band that was trying to get signed. And, uh, and, and that's how when uh, I was working with David Prater, who was also working with Frankie, and that's where he heard um, my track of, uh, of Hungry Eyes. Yeah, now, quick question for you, John. I know you played on an album with a friend of our show, Annie Haslam. Sure. How, how did you come to uh, to play with Annie? Uh, that was through Epic A&R Guy. Um, we actually co-wrote a song. Uh, no, she, she, we, I didn't co-write with her. I wrote with Kit Hain a song called, um, oh gosh, Further From Fantasy, and it, and it was on her record, Annie's record. So it was basically... Uh, a and R guy hearing the song, and at the end of the day, they 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 wanted my production of it basically to for her to sing on, so they just uh, 
they just uh, you know that's how I I got to play with Annie. I mean, she she sang on the track I had for the song. All yeah, right. that's so, a that's a good one to dig up. Yeah, it's, a, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just she, she, she's wonderful to talk with. So I can uh, only imagine what it'd been like you know, playing with her. What a what a um, voice you know she has a oh, voice. voice. Absolutely. Yeah. And then Frankie, you, you mentioned obviously the knockouts, right? Now you had uh, uh, two bands. We talked about you know, uh, earlier about playing Chicago with the uh, two previous bands of yours. Now knockouts, the sweetheart was a bit of a departure for you guys. Okay. Yeah, correct. Yeah, it was the uh, actually, you know, I was, you know, in a in a heavy rock band before that. <laughs> called Bull Angus, which was on uh, Mercury Records. And uh, when that band broke up, I started uh, taking voice lessons again. Uh, and um, I was signed to Buddha Records as an R&B singer. And so I kind of took those two sounds, that R&B singer voice and, and the rock band, and I pulled the guitar player from that rock band, Billy Elworthy. And uh, he and I started writing songs together and I submitted them to uh, Millennium Records uh, with uh, my accountant at that time, Bert Padel. And uh, Jimmy called and said, come on in and, and let, me, uh, let me talk to you about these songs you wrote. And I think what he connected with was my voice because Jimmy was in a band called The Earls back in the day. And I remember when, I guess, was one of their hits. And so he, he heard that doo Italian tenor voice and kind of, you know, had a reminiscence of himself with, you know, back in the doo-wop days. So I, um, he says, listen, I like these songs. If you can write three more songs as good as these songs, I'll give you a record deal. So I wrote three more songs and he said, you know what, I'm going to give you a deal. Now you have a band, right? So it's, it's me and Billy. And I'm like, yeah, 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 I've got a band, no problem. You know, and so he gave us the deal. And uh, right before we were getting ready to go in and record, uh, I wrote this song, which was a more pop-oriented song than the rest of the songs on, on the album called Sweetheart. And, and so Sweetheart, I played it for Jimmy. You got a barking dog there, John. Who let the dogs out? <laughs> I, wish, I wish they would. <laughs> so um, Jimmy just said to me, you know what? It's a really good song, but I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, it's very pop. And the radio is going to pin you as a pop band. He goes, are you ready to put that bullet in the gun? And I said, load the gun. We'll deal with it later. And he was right. You know, radio looked at us as this pop band and RCA was the subsidiary to Millennium. And so whatever other more pop sounding songs were on the record became the second single, You're My Girl, and the third single, Without You. The good news is um, Sweetheart went top 10. You know, You're My Girl was top 20. Without You was top 20. So, you know, we had some success as a band and, and the albums did, did pretty well. They were in the 20s, you know, uh, album radio and album uh, sales. So we, we got established as Frankie and the Knockouts, but you know, the songs that um, you know, ended up being our hits didn't represent us live. We would go out and play this like rock and music and people were like, who, who are these guys? <laughs> and then we'd play Sweetheart and they go, oh, that's who they are. So, you know, we, we kind of had this, um, you know, two different faces of the band. But we had some really, really great players. The drummer, our original drummer was Claude Lehenoff. And then uh, on our second and third album, uh, Tico Torres, the drummer from Bon Jovi, became uh, our heartbeat. And uh, Lee Fox, the bass player, plays for the past 25 years with Blondie, Deborah Harry. And the guitar player, you know, went on to play with Stevie Winwood and has his own blues albums. And, you know, uh, so... The, the, you know, the, what I'm trying to get to is, you know, the players that were in that band were very good. Yeah. Tell me this. What was it like being on American Bandstand and talking with Dick Clark? Uh, it was a, a great experience. I had met him on the airplane flying out to L.A. Um, 
when when Sweetheart came out and started going up the charts, uh, and there still was no band, I you know I went and grabbed some friends and did our first record. So those guys went on to stay in the bands that they were in, and it was me and Billy again. And so our manager at the time, Michael Kleffner, who was managing the Jefferson Starship, called me and said, there's this show called Fridays, and it's kind of like Saturday Night Live, but it's on Friday night. Uh, my, my band, uh, Jefferson Starship, is on it. Why, check it out. So at the end of the show, Larry David comes on. He goes, and next week, special guest. Frankie and the Knockouts. I'm like, holy shit, there's no band. <laughs> and so Michael calls and he's like all excited. I go, Michael, 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 calm down. There's no band. And he goes, you better have one by next Friday because you're playing live on television. Oh, so I called up the guys that did the record. We went out and rehearsed um, Sweetheart and uh, Comeback, those two songs. So our very first gig as a band was live on national television on Fridays. Our second gig was American Bandstand. Our third gig was the Sunday, three in a row. So it was Friday, Saturday, Sunday was Solid Gold with uh, Dion Warwick. Yeah, that, that's three, uh, three pretty big shows there, Frankie. You know, that's, you know, where do you go from there? You know, you... So they put us on the road in two weeks. They said, okay, you got two weeks of rehearsal and you're going to go out for a couple of months with the Beach Boys. So we started touring with the Beach Boys, you know, for about two months, you know, and it was kind of neat because in the beginning they were all chummy with us, you know, and yeah, let's bring the boys out for the encore, yeah, you know. And then Sweetheart all of a sudden goes up the charts. It's number 10. And all the kids are like rushing the stage and the Beach Boys are like freaking out. They're like telling the security, get those kids to sit back down in the chair. You know, and so there was no more, no more the boys in the encore. We were off the tour. <laughs> Hurt by your own success. Yep. Yeah. Well, tell you, Stacey, even as we're talking about TV, you obviously have got a big background in TV. Now, tell us how you wound up doing scoring for television. Well, um, back uh, in New York, uh, I got hooked up with a, uh, where I grew up, I got hooked up with a little recording studio in Connecticut when I was in college. And um, I started doing some writing work for them. I had a early synthesizer set up and a TAC4 track, and I was able to actually compose things at home myself uh, using my setup. And then they... I would do stuff at their studio as well. And they were hiring me to do educational films. And I was started doing that when I was 19. Um, and uh, then once I saw that, okay, this is a path for me, I quit college after two years and just concentrated on that. The studio expanded and we started doing industrial shows. So now I'm writing music for you know, Pan Am and National Airlines and Xerox and learned a tremendous amount. And I was studying composition and jazz piano and classical piano privately from three different teachers. And, uh, but then uh, Wendy Fraser and I met, uh, we were both hired to, uh, for a backup band in a cabaret act. She is a backup singer. I as the pianist and uh, uh, we started dating, then we started living together, and um, we got the opportunity to submit a theme on the Richard Simmons show, and we got it, um, and uh, the show, another unexpected hit, you know, who wants to see this guy, you know, prancing around in little tiny shorts with hair out like this, <laughs> leading people in exercise, but it became this monster hit. And uh, Wendy and I realized that to capitalize on that, we needed to move to L.A., which I was very reluctant to do. I, I'd been to L.A. Um, I was in L.A. once during fire season, and I was up on the top of the rooftop of a hotel and ashes were falling like like Pompeii. And I remember turning to the people I was with and saying, they're going to find us like, you know, in huddled like this in 5000 years. <laughs> So, um, 
anyway, we made the move to L.A., um, not expecting really to work again for a while because it's just hard to break into. But surprisingly, we got another television theme within three weeks of moving there, uh, which was for uh, Regis Philbin. Before his big show, he had a, a morning show on NBC. And but my goal was to do scoring, writing to picture. Um, and that was a very tough business to break into uh, where it was um, just very uh, difficult to get an agent. But after about uh, five years of doing television work, themes and bumpers, I scored a uh, student film uh, for, uh, it was a graduate project from UCLA uh, called Chicken Thing. And that movie ended up, a uh, short 12 minute film, ended up winning 30 awards around the world, including a Student Academy Award. And that, all of a sudden from that, I was picked up by triad artists as a composer. The director of the film, Todd Holland, was picked up by CAA. And then that propelled me into the scoring world. But along that way was meeting Patrick Swayze uh, in his acting class, who turned out to live around the block for me. And we became friends, uh, he and his wife, Lisa, and Wendy and I. And we talk about music. And I had a background doing some music for dance. And, um, and that's how the song was born. Uh, uh, two years before Dirty Dancing, because we wrote it for a movie called Grandview USA, and thank God it was not used in that. <laughs> sorry, yeah. Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah, sorry, Jamie Lee and Tommy Howell. So, yeah. uh, but um, but yeah, so that's basically uh, how I got into it. It's it's a process, you know. It's it's um, uh, you you have to just be very single-minded about slogging your way through the industry itself, which in LA can be quite brutal, but toughens you. I mean, you learn a lot. Um, and then, you know, after Chicken Thing, then around the same time, we were recording the final version of She's Like the Wind for Dirty Dancing. And then one year later, that exploded as Frankie and, and John were saying. It, it's it's remarkable. But uh, but yeah, but the Richard Simmons show is my first national television theme. I was 24 years old when we wrote it. Wendy was 23. Awesome. Uh, tell me this: the, the the soundtrack to Dirty Dancing, you know, had not only the the, the new songs that you guys you know, had written, but you had stuff from the Contours and the Ronettes, you know, mixed in there. How many of the songs uh, that were on the soundtrack were records that you guys had, you know, when you were younger? For me, it was a deal. I mean, you know, I was always a big fan of um, uh, the Ronettes. So uh, I, I, I think her voice was just one of the wow. most unique voices there's ever been. And that whole production style of Phil Spector, you know, I used to listen to it and, and then used to hear other people borrowing it. Like the beginning of Billy Joel's Turnstiles records begins with Liberty DeVito on drums going boom, 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 boom. Bum, bum, bum. And that's the song Say Goodbye to Hollywood, which then uh, Ronnie Spector uh, covered. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's uh, I was familiar with with a lot of the music. Yeah. A lot of that was a little before my time. Um, more oh, like are you telling me I'm old? <laughs> no, I, I'm, you're, you're younger than me, I think. But, I, I, you know, I, I would maybe hear those songs <clears throat> through my brother. Um, because that, most of that stuff was uh, early 60s, late 50s, early 60s. Good, you know, well, I guess it was not 50s, really. It was 60s. Uh, I might have heard a couple of those on the radio. I mean, but, you know, in, in retrospect, now when I listen to that stuff, and I, I just go, my God, you know, uh, Solomon Burke and Otis Redding. I mean, that, that that's a beautiful soundtrack to, besides... The new songs, which include our three and another three songs, um, that's a, that and more Dirty Dancing have just uh, you know stellar you know music on it, and and those were those songs like a Solomon Burke or Otis Redding, they were recorded in the heyday really of the sonics of uh, audio to me. I mean, it was still tube gear and tape, and so that stuff and a lot of it was live playing. They played together. 
Um, that's why those records hold up. But they, they just, uh, it, I, I read somewhere where uh, analog music print, re prints in your brain better than a digital recording. No, there's a warmth to it. There's a warmth to Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I just yeah. heard a, I just heard a statistic uh, on NPR this morning. I heard that um, uh, LP sales, vinyl record sales, topped $1 billion last year. Yeah. And that has been growing, growing steadily every year. And by the way, today is a record store day. Oh, great. And so um, they feel that since the institution of record store day, it's fueled the growth of the sales of LPs and brick and mortar record stores are coming back. Well, well guess what? You, know, you, you, you now, you know, back in the day, you'd look forward to picking up that album and looking at the pictures, reading the credits. You know, and, and you know, ha having a tangible thing in your hands. You know, you look forward to that, and so I'm so excited and happy that what goes around is finally coming around, right. and, and kids can relive that experience because it it's what kept, it's what kept the music alive. Right. You know, for so many years is now you can go back and. I have a collection of, you know, the Beatle White album and Hendrix and all these albums that I bought back in the day. And I can go, you know, in my closet, pull them out, and look at them. Were yeah, you the, going to pull out a, uh, you know, a streaming file and go, you know, go, go read some credits? How many, yeah, hours, you know what? how many hours did we sit? I, I, I remember going home from, you know, ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th grade, going into my room putting an LP on and just laying on the bed and staring at the LP for hours. You know, that, that was, that was it. Yeah. That was it. Absolutely. Yeah, the the we greatest got a show uh, about how the whole experience, the, the difference between then and now going into a record store and you just got bins and bins and bins and the cover art. Yeah. Right. That, that you would see. And to this day, when you see those, you see that cover art from different albums, it immediately takes you back to yeah. when you saw that album in the record store. And like you guys said, uh, you know, reading the liner notes, you know, you don't get that anymore. You've got that intrinsic experience that you get, you know, with the, the printed materials that you just don't get courtesy of the streaming service. Not to, oh, mention, the read it. Not to mention the electric you feel when you drop the needle on that record, you, it kind of goes right through your hand and, and then, you know, you just hear it come out the speakers. It's a tactile experience. Yeah, tell me this, John, what was the first LP you bought? Uh, well, I remember my, I, I, I remember being given an early Jefferson airplane that my brother gave me, uh, he gave me the wrong one. I, I wanted Surrealistic Pillow. He gave me <laughs> the, the other one that came before that. But I, I do remember, vividly my, my uh cousin uh who was much older than me uh they had a, a one stop in hicksville new york hicksville long island mm -hmm. and um, my mom took me over there and they had it in their garage mm -hmm. and my mom i was this is 1967 i was 12 and um my mom said you can buy three records and i came out of there with for, for like 3.99 i came out of there with mr fantasy traffic's record Moby Grape, first record, record, and Jimi Hendrix, Are You Experienced? So that was it. I was, I was. That's you know, a home run. That was a home run. And that's what I became a musician, I think, because of that. You know? Yeah. How about you, Frankie? What was the first LP you bought? Uh, probably uh, because I was really into the Rascals back in, in, uh, in the early 60s. So um, probably the first Rascal record. And uh, I have uh, that record signed by all of them. Oh wow! And I became friends with uh, with Gene, and so I got I was able to get all, all of their autographs on, on that record. So that was probably my first record that I bought. But my sister, who was four years older than me, you know, back in the fifties, she was turning me on to uh, the Dick Clark Show out of Philadelphia, American Bandstand. And so I used to sit with her back in like 1958, 59, 60, around that era and, and watch American Bandstand. And 
that that was more of like uh, you know Dion and and these like more doo wop kind of acts, and so that you know that was an influence, you know, uh, the, vocally because my dad was an opera singer, so uh, I was always looking for the blue notes because my dad was hitting the Italian notes, <laughs> and so you know I I wanted to know you know, where, where soul music, how to sing that kind of music. So when I was, uh, I think I was 13, I started a band, a group, an acapella group with myself and, and four black guys. And we used to rehearse at the train station because they had this long corridor and there was this natural reverb in the corridor. And so we'd go do this, what we call blow harmonies. And so I would do these Frankie Lyman tunes and they would do these blow harmonies behind me and people, you know, going from one train to another train would stop and we'd have like, you know, 40, 50 people around us. And so, you know, we had like these little audiences in the train station. So that doo-wop thing was really the start of me, you know, getting into music. Yeah. How about you, Stacey? I heard about me too. The the first one... I grew up with a lot of music in the house. Neither of my parents were musicians, but my father listened to a lot of jazz and classical music. Mm. My mother listened to a lot of show tunes and folk music. Um, and then I started, you know, getting into certain things. But the first record I remember buying was Procol Harum's first record, mm. with Lighter Shade of Pale, because yeah. I was I was a keyboard player, and uh, Procol Harum had the bonus of having an organ player and the piano player. So I loved, and they're very classically oriented in their, um, you know, they based Whiter Shade of Pale on Bach. And uh, yeah, and then the, um, but, you know, like Frankie was saying, a record that blew my mind and changed the course of things for me was not one that I bought, but one my father came home with when I was about 11 years old. So that would have been 1967 or so. And he said, oh, I saw this in the record store. I figured I'd pick it up. And it was called Blues on Top of Blues by B.B. King. Mm. It was B.B. King it, recording in Memphis with a brass section. And the first song was called uh, You're a Mean Heartbreaker. And it begins with this brass coming in like. And I remember he put it on. I was just sitting in the family room like, oh, my God. <laughs> and then I'm listening to the keyboard parts, you know, behind him. And I remember thinking, I have to learn how to do that. And so I became a, a huge blues fan. Um, you know, to this day, if I sit down at the piano and try to just relax, I'll play, you know. You know, like that. So uh, it's, um, but yeah, and I was, gonna, the, the greatest gift I was given for my bar mitzvah in 1969, one of my parents' friends who knew I was really into music uh, got me a $25 gift certificate to Sam Goody. Mm -hmm. um, Sam Goody would do these sales like every few months. So I waited for the sale and I redeemed the gift certificate and came home with eight records oh, eight wow. out of $25, including Blood, Sweat and Tears second record, which I didn't like nearly as much as Blood, Sweat, and Tears' first record, which was one of the most brilliant records. Killer. Ever. Records. Al Cooper, Killer. man, Al Cooper. And yeah. they kicked, yeah. probably yeah. kicked him out. Has yeah. one of yeah. my favorite songs on it, Without Her, on that record. Yeah. That, that was, uh, Without Her was... Um, that was on the first one, wasn't it? Yeah, that's on the first one. Yeah. But, you know, I became, friends, I became friends with Al Cooper years later, which was nice. incredible to meet my boyhood hero. Yeah. He also had a band called The Blues Project, which was amazing. But that's that's how I felt when I met Bill Medley, and I opened for him like a few years ago uh, over here in Asbury Park. There's a convention hall, and then there's this uh, Paramount Theater holds about seventeen, eighteen hundred people. So I put a band together called The Brotherhood with Mark Rivera on sax, and um, one of the lead singers from Trans Siberian Or. Oops. Oops, can't hear you. And am I back? I don't know. There I am. Yeah, yeah. you're back. And, and so, you know, being able to, you know, open up for Bill Medley, 
you know, and be hang with him backstage, you know, was like, you know, really just the first time that I had an encounter with a guy that I looked up to as a singer and Bobby Hatfield because I was a tenor, but the Righteous Brothers, you know, and Bill then, you know, comes out and he goes, I like to uh, talk about this song that I'm about to sing. And it's, there's a guy out there making a lot of money from this song. <laughs> that sounds like Bill. <laughs> And so he, he sang Time of My Life with his daughter, which was wow. very cool. It was very cool to hear him do that. So I get where you're, where you're coming from when you meet, you know, Al Cooper. That had to be yeah. an experience. Well, what was amazing, he got a little offended at one point. It was, we were talking and I said, you know, there's a, a, a song on the first Blood, Sweat and Tears record called The Further Adventures of Plato, Diogenes and Freud, which has these incredible string quartet parts. And so I said, who did you bring in to do the string uh, arrangements? And he just looked at me and says, I wrote those string arrangements. And so I said, <laughs> oh, God, that's, that's fantastic. And he also told me, uh, you know, because he did a lot of the horn arrangements for the band. Right. Uh, a lot of people don't realize at the beginning of You Can't Always Get What You Want by the Stones, Al's playing that French horn part. Oh. And originally the Stones hired him to do a whole... Uh, brass arrangement for the beginning of the song uh, based on what he did, you know, on Blood, Sweat and Tears. And they heard the, uh, just the French horn and they said, oh, that's what we want. We just want the French horn. So that's him playing on that. He's playing organ for, you know, Bob Dylan. Amazing, amazing talent. Crusty guy, but an amazing talent. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, the Bob Dylan story, of course, being a famous one. Yeah. Well, Story about you know he was he, well, I don't know, he, he quick story is is he 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 was just invited to the session he wasn't supposed to play on it and he he was a guitarist at the time he brought his guitar in and he heard Mike Bloomfield warming up and he said oh well, I'm not getting the guitar gig that's for sure and when the when the producer got pulled out of the room for a second because the guy kept you know he kept asking let me get in the session he's like no Al you're you're you know, let me play an organ. He goes, no, you're you're not an organist, Al. And, and uh, when the guy went to pick up a phone call, Al slipped in there. The 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 guy who was playing organ switched switched to piano, and so Al slipped on that organ. On uh, um, was it which? What's the famous one? Um, so, um, once upon a yeah. time, just so fast. Uh, yeah. Uh, how does so, it get that one? That's how that's how he slipped into that gig. It, it, when the producer came back in, I think his name was uh, I forget that guy's name, but he came back in and he's going, "Al, what are you what are you doing in there?" And, and Dylan goes, "No, no, I like it. Let him stay." Well, Al played organ for the uh, uh, the Blues Project, his band. He yeah. played a, a Farfisa duo compact. Which Would that have been before the Bob Dylan thing? Or I think that was before because they they started the Blues Project like nineteen. Well, it may, may have been around the same time, 1965-66. I know he was he was kind of doing guitar as a which yeah. I was unbeknownst to me. I always look at him as a keyboard player. Right. Yeah. Pretty cool stuff. All these little tidbits that I learn every every time we. I know I was saying that I I didn't know some of the stuff <clears throat> you mentioned before about Frank and the knockout. So we learn something every time here. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, tell you what, bringing it back to to the to, to the soundtrack. Actually, yeah, writing the songs. Now, Stacy, you mentioned before that she's like the wind was actually written for Grandview, USA. And to digress further, I remember yeah, uh, yeah reading where uh, the the story about you actually meeting an interesting story that you knew him from. That uh, that you remembered him. It was from a, from a, uh, seeing him around uh, around by the house. Yeah, what happened was he was attending an acting class called the uh, Beverly Hills Playhouse, and the teacher was a, a well known teacher in L.A. at the time named Milton Kinsellis. And I had a, another friend who was a very good musical comedy guy uh, who was in the class as a student as well. <laughs> he asked me to come into the class to play piano for him on a scene that he was doing from uh, Shenandoah. And so, and I had a lot of experience as an accompanist, which he knew. And so we did the scene and it turned into a whole discussion with the class 
about theater and music in theater and all this, which I participated in. And also looking around about 65 students and there's a young Alec Baldwin, there's Tom Selleck, there's, you know, all these, uh, Mimi Rogers was in the class, President Reagan's daughter, Patty, was in the class. So it was, it was interesting. But then the class took a break after our segment was finished and uh, I was gathering up the music and this guy came over to me who looked vaguely familiar and he said, hi, I'm Buddy. Um, you know, I really like your playing and what you were saying about theater. And I was late and I said, you know, you look really familiar. And uh, he said, well, did you see The Outsiders? And I said, no. And he said, did you see Renegades? And I said, no. And I said, it's not that kind of familiar. It's like I'm somewhere. And then this blonde woman came over and he said, oh, this is my wife, Lisa. And I said, OK, now I know the two of you are always working on a black 240Z on La Jolla Avenue on the weekends. And they said, yeah, how do you know that? And I said, I live right around the block from you. I, I'm two houses away. And so that's how we became friends, just hanging out. And, uh, you know, me and my girlfriend, Wendy, um, who is the voice that you hear on She's Like the Wind at the end. She's the final voice, uh, the, the girl. And um, but that's how we became friends. And it's we were friends through his whole life. And we worked on some other things together as well, including a wonderful stage piece in L.A. that we did at the Beverly Hills Playhouse. Yeah, you guys also wrote a song that was on the the Roadhouse soundtrack too, correct? Yeah, Cliff's Edge. So uh, they just re-released that soundtrack record for some reason. I have no idea why, but it's uh, <laughs> it was it was it's funny. Not the question why? Yeah, it's it's a different type of. It was source music, so it was I think coming out of a jukebox at one point, and um, not you know the way our songs were featured in Dirty Dancing. So, uh, but but it was fun. Yeah. Now, writing Time of My Life, how did you guys come up with that one? Um, it kind of came through Jimmy Einder, the uh, president of Millennium Records. At that time, two years um, prior to that, Jimmy decided he was going to go into the film business and close up uh, Millennium Records because he had some uh, some film companies that he was working with. And... Uh, so I went back to selling cars out of my driveway, you know, trying to, you know, raise enough money to stay alive and, and continue to write songs. And uh, in doing so, uh, I was going to this uh, guy named David Prater in his basement to do these demos. So I would be able to play them for, you know, record labels trying to get another deal. And David turned me on to, to John and just said, I've got this, you know, guy that comes to the, you know, to the studio as well, and he's got some really cool music. Let me play you a piece of his music. So he, he played me the instrumental version of a song. And I said, you know what? I really, really like the music. And can I talk to John? So John and I talked and John was like, yeah, go ahead, give it a whirl. And so that very first song that John and I wrote was called Hungry Eyes. And so that was our start. And we continued to write songs and write songs for about another good six months. So we had a good collection of songs for the next Frankie and the Knockout record, the fourth record. And then out of the blue, Jimmy Einer called me and said, I have this little movie and I'd like you to try to write a song for it. There's been 149 songs submitted that got turned down. You've got two weeks. And, you know, uh, and I said, Jimmy, I don't have time. I, I'm trying to get a record deal and I just don't have time, Jimmy. He goes, make time. This is going to change your life. And I'm like, right. <laughs> so I said, all right, what's the name of the movie, Jimmy? And so when he said Dirty Dancing, my hand went to my forehead and I said, oh, Jimmy's doing porn. I'm thinking he's doing a porn flick. And he goes, no, no, this is a good little movie. Baby meets Johnny and, the, you know. It's in the Catskills and the father doesn't like the kid. And he gave us a like a really two minute description of the film, but did say that it was for the last scene and that it had to be seven minutes long. And I'm thinking, well, there goes any chance of having a single. So my first thought was I'm going to give John a call because we're working together and I'm liking what we're doing together. 
And so John sat down and started putting a track together and, and uh, called his friend because his friend had eight tracks. And I think, John, you had four tracks. Or... No, I actually didn't have anything at that moment. I, I um, He had a, a tape machine and, a, and a, you know, I figured in the 80s, uh, drum machines were just starting and he had a drum machine and, and we had been working together. Uh, a guy named Don Markowitz who's the co-writer. And um, uh, we went to his place and just- Banged out a track. Just pounded out the, the you know, the, the idea started. We knew from what Jimmy told Frankie that it should start slow and then, you know, build into a dance, you know, rhythm. And um, originally it was a little, a couple of beats per minute faster. And I remember Kenny Ortega, when he finally heard uh, what we, Frankie submitted, um, he said, it's got to be slowed down. So we had to go back in the studio and, and uh, kind of retrack everything. I, I think, yeah, yeah. I don't think we kept it. We anything. went over to Tony Camillo's. Right. And we added like Kungas and Timbales. Right. So but we when, still had a drum machine and we still had a synth bass. Right. So when John sent me the track, I played that track over the phone to Jimmy. And he was like, yeah, yeah, it sounds really good. Make a song. So I was on my way to David Prater's on, on the Garden State Parkway, exit 140, paid the toll, jammed this CD that John sent me into my dashboard. Hey, tape, tape. Correct. Cassette. Uh, cassette, excuse me. Oh, John. CDs, yeah. Cassettes there. Uh, and just started listening to the music. And how I write is I have to find a melody first. And in finding a melody, sometimes phonetic sounds come out of me, which help me sometimes create what I'm thinking about what the chorus should be. So it's, nin -nin and I'm of my life, nin -nin and I'm of my life. You know, so I'm scribbling time of my life on an envelope and thinking, okay, well, there's, there's maybe what the chorus could be. And, you know, not really knowing anything about the movie and when Patrick saw me at the Academy Awards, he goes, it was like you were here watching the movie when you wrote the lyrics. How did you know to write those lyrics? And I was like, I didn't write the lyrics. The man upstairs wrote the lyrics because I had no idea what your movie was about. <laughs> so he was like, you really, that song, you know, we were getting ready to film and we didn't have the, a song. And yours was the last one we heard, the 150th cassette. And when we heard it, it was like, we're making the movie to that song. And because by the end of the day, we just looked at each other and went, oh my God, let's go make a movie. Because they had really good endings. So it kind of changed the camaraderie for the actors and the directors and, and the producers about their feeling about the film having this ending. So it was kind of neat to know you, you wrote a piece of music that could do that. But music has a habit of doing that. Yeah, the right absolutely. Yeah, part, partly what Emil said, it, it was just a convergence of things that no one could premeditate, you know, just, you know, just things came together for a, a, a small budget movie. Um, you know, it was Jennifer, as she said the other day when I was watching, it was her first starring role. She, she was a little worried how she would be with Patrick. Um, she had just finished that Red Dawn movie with him, and she, she was hoping for some like Latino machismo thing, and uh, that's how how she explained it. But so it was just a convergence of stuff, that, you know. Emil Delino, uh, the director, you know, uh, said and it was like no one could have predicted it, no one could have put it together knowingly. It just stars aligned. Organically yeah. happened. Yeah. 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 You, know, now you mentioned the, even yeah, go ahead, John. They couldn't, uh, they didn't have that many, uh, you know, a, a Columbia film or MGM or whatever. They get a, a, a way more theaters for the premiere of a movie than this did. This had a small amount of theaters. And, and that's when, like you said, Frankie, that's the people just came in droves and they had to, you know, expand and it just took off. Even in its heyday, though. I still think that the amounts of theaters was still limited because of the because of Estron because it wasn't the huge 
you know, huge company. Well, Vestron wasn't a huge film company, and they were kind of known for doing some kind of porn stuff. So, you know, having a title called Dirty Dancing coming from Vestron, you know, yeah. maybe people were scratching their head, you know, do we want to get involved with this? It's, it's funny to, a story just came to my mind to show how it shifted everybody that the afternoon of New Year's Day of 87 into 88, uh, Buddy Patrick called me and said, I want to see how famous I've become. And I said, well, how do you plan on doing that? He said, I want you, me and Lisa to have dinner tonight at Spago for their seven o'clock seating. And Spago was the hottest restaurant in LA, uh, Wolfgang Puck's first place. And on a normal night, you had to call two months in advance to get a reservation. So, you know, so at New Year's, the afternoon of New Year's, you know, it was impossible. So I said, let me call first using my name. And the the maitre d' was incredibly nasty to me on the phone. And I said, so there's no way in the world that anybody could have three people seated at seven o'clock tonight. He said, you, you, that's correct. If you'd like to make another reservation, uh, I'll be happy to help you, but otherwise we're busy. Click. I called back buddy and I said, you're on. Two minutes later, he called me, he said, we're in seven o'clock. <laughs> and so that's, that's how he knew he had become incredibly famous. That's great. Yeah. And absolutely. well deserved. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned the demos, Frankie. Now, the demos have uh, now have a second life, if you will, and uh, they're supporting a very good cause. Tell us about that. You know, um, after the success, it was overwhelming. And after Patrick passed, I was like, just like thinking, how, what can I do? How can I give back, you know, in Patrick's memory? And so the three of us decided that we were going to uh, take these demos and try to do something with them. So I, I did a cold call to the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, and I talked to um, the, the person who actually had started, Pamela, who started the, um, the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, and she just happened to pick up the phone. I told her who I was and said, you know, we have an idea <clears throat> that we would like to sell these demos and whatever we make, all of it will go to the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. So that was like 30 years ago. And so we've raised close to $30,000 people purchasing those demos. And you can go to Facebook, which is Dirty Dancing Demos on Facebook, and, you know, I, I post all the time different things of what's happening with the movie and Patrick. And you can actually purchase Time of My Life, Hungry Eyes. And there's a third song called Someone Like You that John and I wrote that's in the stage play, Dirty Dancing, which is an instrumental version of the song. <clears throat> but actually, the, the lyrical version to me, um, that, that song could be a hit record as well. Uh, but they just decided that they would use it thematically behind the scene. So those three songs are on these demos, and uh, we donate that money to the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network in Buddy's honor, in Patrick's honor. Very and, nice. And those are um, what they filmed, too. Yeah, they, they filmed those, each of these um, demos. They didn't so have a piece of history. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very nice. Thank you. Uh, now, obviously, you guys have done things since uh, since Dirty Dancing. Now, John, I know you've got an album uh, that's uh, pretty current. She said, "Tell us about that album." Yeah, well, I uh, for the first time uh, going back in twenty nineteen. <laughs> time time flies when you're in COVID. Um, twenty nineteen, I put a record out called uh, um, "The Why Because." which had um, songs that I had written for others uh, along, uh, four of them with Frankie and, uh, for, you know, two, one being The Time of My Life, Hungry Eyes, and a couple of others. One was in a Sylvester Stallone movie. And th so there were, it was comprised of songs that I had written uh, 
you mentioned um, Wider Shade of Pale, uh, one I had written with John Wade and um, Keith Reed from Circle uh, uh, Harem. And, um, and that, you know, that was received. I, I, I don't really know why I decided at this point in my career to put out a record, but I had fun. I had a lot, I have a studio out in the barn over here and I had a lot of fun. And then uh, two years later during the pandemic, I, I, I wrote, put together 10 songs, all new, except for one that Frankie and I had written a while back, but everything else was brand new that I kind of wrote with uh, various songwriters uh, um, that were, you know, for me, with me in mind as a vocalist and a, which I, 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 you know, five years ago, I wouldn't have even thought about it. I don't, I just sort of happened naturally. And uh, I've had a lot of fun because after years of trying to write for someone, what someone would want to sing, or, or, you know, whether it be a female or a male, or try and get in their heads, the, the shackles were removed and I could just be me for the first time, really. Um, so it, it was a lot of fun. We're just about to put out a, a video for, uh, she said that my son did here on the farm and it's, it's kind of a little movie. Uh, it's really a movie um, with the song she said behind it. But um, yeah, that's, uh, that's what I've been doing. Just um, being an artist for the first time in my life. <laughs> and it's Let me ask you, are you back to New York or are you gonna stay on the farm? Well, you know, well, I mean, we still have our place in, in the West Village, so my son is living there now, but uh, I'm sure we'll be back and forth once things are completely, you know, on I, slope. I don't really feel like getting COVID. I, I, I kind of, you know, I, I feel like, so when it, when the coast is clear, we've, we've gone back a couple of times here and there, but. Uh, okay. Country life has been. Uh, um, Relaxed. Agreeable to me. Well, you know, I, I get to go out into the bar and I have all this vintage analog gear, courtesy of Dirty Dancing, and I go, you know, plug it in and make music. I, I'm also working with, you know, I, I, I mentioned Moby Grape. Um, I'm actually P P working another Peter Lewis record. Uh, Peter was one of the founding members of Moby Grape. He's, um, his mother was Loretta Young. Huh. Um, but uh, so and and then uh, you know just some artists that I know through the years we, we go in the barn and and cut records but uh, it's it's um, what, what more can you ask for we have you know as long as you're happy fresh air and uh, music that's it music and happiness does it get any better <laughs> no it doesn't get any better. maybe <laughs> how about you Frankie what, what kind of project you got going. Um, you know, I just uh, actually doing a project with my wife, who uh, Lisa Sherman, and she was an ex rockhead and Broadway performer and had her own television show in New Zealand for nine years. And we have kind of a celebration of James Taylor, Carly Simon, Carol King called the Taylor Simon King Show. Uh, and you can actually see at the uh, electronic press kits, there's some videos of that show, TaylorSimonKing.com. And uh, it's just a celebration of these three American troubadours and their lives and how they intertwined and how their music became the backdrop to a decade uh, of, uh, you know, for all of us. And there are memorable songs. I mean, people are in the audience singing along with almost just about every song because they're, they're so known. And um, it, it's really great to see. And so that's what I'm doing beside, you know, the, the charity events. I put out a song called One World that I wrote in Moscow with a, an Estonian back in the 90s that we donated to charity as well. Our Earth, Wind and Fire recorded that song on Columbia and then re-recorded it again. So just, you know, things to uh, try to get back and keep my feet moving, stay in the music. And, and that's what makes me happy. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, just uh, you, you mentioned the... Uh, uh, that project. Is that where you met Cindy Lauper? I did meet Cindy in Moscow. Um, and then she and I wrote a song together with uh, Sergei Manukian, who is like the big star in Moscow at that time, uh, called Cold Sky. 
And that was also on that record was called Music Speaks Louder Than Words. And there was some incredible, incredible songwriters, Barry Mann, Mike Stoller, Cindy Lapo, Diane Warren, Desmond Child, that all wrote songs for that record that where I was there with in, in Moscow. So I was very honored to be included in that, you know, just those are really some really good, great songwriters. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Stacy, you have unexpectedly found yourself in the world of photography. Yes, it's uh, very unexpected. Um, in 2015, I attended a songwriter workshop in um, Tuscany, in Italy, uh, my first time in Italy. And they, uh, it was about 12 of us at a villa. And I went there as a student because the woman leading the workshop is Gretchen Peters, who's one of my favorite songwriters in the world. And she advocates a lot of writing by yourself. And for songwriting for me, I did mostly collaboration. And I thought this might be a way to explore working by myself. But the unexpected thing that happened was I had bought a new camera to take with me to Italy, the Sony uh, camera. And I saw that it had a black and white function on it. And I grew up obsessed with black and white movies. Uh, Turner Classic Movies is still my favorite channel. And um, my parents were into photography, not, well, my father took pictures, but there were a lot of photo books around the house, like Cartier, Bresson. And all of a sudden, it's like I was living this fan, looking at everything in black and white, saying, oh my God, I'm, I'm living in an Italian Fellini movie. And I started taking pictures of people and a photographer friend saw the photos and said, you've got to keep doing that wherever you go because these photos are really good. Uh, so on subsequent trips to Havana and Washington, D.C., I just started taking my camera wherever I went. And in 2018, I went back to Italy to the same villa, but this time by myself. And I took pictures in Florence and Siena and Lucca and then came back from that trip and had a couple printed out at a pro professional place here in town. Um, and uh, the woman that works there was looking at me and she said, did you take these photos? And I said, yeah, why? And she said, do you have more like this? And I said, yeah, a lot now. So she said, okay, go around the block. There's an art store, buy a portfolio, start getting more photos printed and start filling the portfolio because we think you're onto something. And so I did, and that turned, you know, turned into me getting a show of my work at a great gallery downtown Nashville. Um, and now I've won four international awards for my photography. Uh, tomorrow is a great photography group uh, that I belong to on uh, Facebook called Inspired Street Photography. Um, there's like 80,000 members around the world. Tomorrow they're doing a spotlight on me with 12 of my photos in an interview. And then I'm getting a second show at a new gallery in town called Prima Signa, which carries like Helmut Newton and Slim Aarons and all these great classic photographers. And now they're doing a show of my work along with a, a painter. So we're splitting the show. So it's really exciting. Eight pieces of mine have sold now. It's it's bizarre. It's, it's totally because I never studied it. I never, you know, did anything really seriously with it. And now it's about so an eye. Huh? It's about having an eye. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, it, and, and also with street photography, it's also seeing people and empathizing immediately, which I think is where the music helps. Because mm -hmm. music, you're making an you're reaching somebody emotionally. And with a photo, you can do the same thing if you're capturing a person in the right way. So it's it's just it's been a, a blast, and um, you know uh, I was on before this call. I was uh, you know uh, working out the uh, with the painter the RSVP list for our uh, private reception. So nice. it's, yeah, it's just really fun. Wow, always neat when you wind up doing something you never thought you would. Well, besides that, I also served for four years on in city government. Uh, in Oak Hill, where I live, we have our own uh, board of commissioners, and uh, I was got involved with some political stuff in 2014, 
then I, I ran for office in 2016 and won uh, by 12%. And uh, uh, so I was actually vice mayor of the city of Oak Hill. And uh, so believe me, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, if somebody said, you know, you're, you're going to be a, an elected official at some point, uh, I would have said, no, you're, you're out of your mind. So every, <laughs> everything is an interesting journey. Absolutely. Well, tell me this, guys. Is there anything along the, the dirty dancing journey that we didn't touch on? Well, just that it's the 35th anniversary this yeah. year of Dirty Dancing. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that uh, are coming out of the woodwork where they're re-showing the movie in big theaters and asking right. us to kind of go in and do a question and, and you know, an answer to the, with the audience. And so there's this resurgence of 35 years later that this movie is still relevant and it's still the, the elephant in the room, you know? Yeah. It's still the, and the, the musical is running again at the, the Dominion Theater in London. And there's another yeah. thing in London, which is Dirty Dancing the Concert or something like that. Yeah. Where they yeah. show the film and then the songs are performed live. And try, it's, it's nuts. Yeah, they, they're kind of doing that so they don't have to pay the grand rights and don't have to pay us writers. And, and yeah, publishers. right, right. Yeah. So, so they get away with, uh, oh, yeah, we're just going to show the movie and then you know, have a band play behind it. Right. Yeah. It's kind of a, to me as a, as a writer, it's kind of a rip. <laughs> well, although the UK is pretty good about collecting on that type of stuff. They've, they've got completely different type of sync license rules. Yeah, they do. They do. But yeah. I heard they're trying to come to the United States. Oh, no. Well, that'll be a different issue then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they will meet, they will meet the people known as the attorneys. So, uh, <laughs> all well, right, well, guys. Well, that's how how they stay alive. Good. Yeah. Uh, any final thoughts, guys? Not really. I think you know we do this uh, every couple of weeks, and we always find out a, a new tidbit. Yeah. yeah. So we found out our new tidbit this week. Well, and, I, uh, I, I I look forward to uh, possibly seeing my friends at the Dirty Dancing Festival, but I'm sure we'll talk way before that. And, and the tidbit that I picked up from this interview, because John is normally not in this room, is I see a bass clarinet. And yeah. so yeah, I didn't realize you actually play the bass clarinet. I play a little bit of everything. No, that's great. I can't play the gosh darn flute that's back there, though. I cannot play a flute. There's a soprano sax, you know, and, you know, guitar, bass, all that stuff. But the flute, I cannot get the armature right. Who's the jazz? Yeah, blow across it. Yeah, right. yeah Eric, <laughs> Eric Dolphy was the great jazz musician who used uh, would play bass clarinet. Yeah, in some of his yeah. and uh, Herbie Hancock on the on on those records. Um, Benny Margolis is his, I think was his name. I'm not sure that he he was also playing bass kind of very cool sound like on that. Um, what is that uh, that album Frost? There's a song called, uh, I forget what it's called. It's a very laid back tune and it's got beautiful, that, that's really why I bought it because I love that sound so much. Right. Yeah. But the only other thing I wanted to mention, I, I do have a, a small record label, omadrecords.com, O-M-A-D records.com. And that's where you'll, you'll find my stuff and, and the artists that I'm been working with that are on the label. You gotta check out John's version of Hungry Eyes. Yeah, it's great. Uh, which went uh, top twenty-two, I think, on the AC charts a couple of years ago. It's, it, it's a, it's a cool rendition. It's one of my favorite renditions of Hungry Eyes. You got to check that out. You can go to his label and find it. There's also the the video for it on YouTube. That um, uh, everybody is is masked and um, yeah, it was put out at the height of the the okay. height of mask wearing. <laughs> And I asked people to take their phone and just film themselves with a mask on for five, 10 seconds and all cut in on, on that version. So, yeah. Oh, so right. that's everything we know. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds like a good point to wrap this one up then. <laughs> all right. Well, tell you what, I want to thank you guys for taking the time out to, to join us here on the show. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it's Michael. 
All right, everybody. Thank you for watching. Everybody, have All a good right. night. See you guys right. soon. This has been Music Night at the Majestic with Michael Boswell. If you enjoyed this edition of Music Night at the Majestic, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and at musicnight.net. Music Night at the Majestic is a copyright production of Starliner Media. Any use of the accounts and descriptions of this program, its audio or visual content, without the express written consent of Starliner Media is prohibited. Thank you for joining us this evening. We'll see you next time for Music Night at the Majestic. This is your announcer speaking. Starliner Media.